Good morning. Today is Wednesday, August 19th, and we'll be looking at the 12th chapter of the Gospel of John. As promised, the story of the anointing at Bethany. Apparently, in John's Gospel, the one who anoints Jesus with the very expensive ointment from the alabaster jar is Mary of Bethany, Martha's sister, Lazarus' sister, and in the other Gospels, this woman is unnamed. And uh, in the Gospel where the, he's at the Pharisee's house, he, uh, she is said to have been a sinful woman. And she's very grateful for what uh, Jesus has done for her. And somehow it gets all mashed up in together and we we think somehow that this is Mary Magdalene uh, and it doesn't really uh, make a lot of sense, but that's what tradition sort of conglomerated the gospels together to lead us into this conclusion, which is really unfounded. If you look strictly at the text and understand who Mary Magdalene is, she is not the same as Mary of Bethany and she is not a prostitute. It is never mentioned that she's a prostitute. It is mentioned that she does have uh, demons that Jesus delivered her from. So if you can interpret that that way, maybe, but um, it, it gets so mashed up because of the name Mary. Uh, so Mary Bethany anoints Jesus, and this is in pre pre precedes his his burial, and this is the encounter with um, uh, Judas the betrayer, who says, "Surely this could have been sold, and um, the money given to the poor, and she's wasted it all over you, Lord." And that's when Jesus says, you know, you always have the poor with you, but you won't always have me. I won't be, I, I'm only here for a short time. So do not do this to her. Do not dismiss her. Do not be dismissive of her actions either. Accept them and accept me. And she has given me what uh, is important for the time that we find ourselves in. So they don't understand everything that's going on. Anointed of Bethany, Bethany it is Mary of Bethany that does it. Um, Jesus' opponent, opponents want to kill him. And uh, they want to kill, actually, they want to kill Lazarus because Lazarus is living proof of Jesus' power. And the power threatens their power because ultimately you have to understand that it's power from God. If he can raise Lazarus from the dead, what he's talking about is true. Like we need to start believing in him. And again and again in John's gospel, they do not believe in him. They do not, you do not believe in me. I don't, they, they didn't believe in him. It's all this statement. Never believe, never believe, never believe. So um, the power is a threat. And then we have Palm Sunday. And this is where Jesus has political power because the people are with him. The people that saw him raise Lazarus from the dead just a few short, short verses ago, and they are joining in the Hosannas at the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on what we celebrate Palm Sunday for. This is happening, and the people have gathered, and they're in great numbers, and they're in great force, and the authorities, the opponents of Jesus say, what can one do? Actually, it mentions that they're Pharisees, but it says, what can one do in the face of all these crowds and people and this favoritism that Jesus has found himself in. Now that's the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Just wait. He won't always be favored. Uh, then there's this part where the Greeks come and they want to speak with Jesus. They want to see Jesus. They want to have an audience with Jesus. And um, so Philip tells Andrew and somebody else and they, they so they, you know, he doesn't just go straight to Jesus. He tells somebody else, they tell, and then they all tell Jesus. So when they tell Jesus, some Greeks want to meet with you, he says, it's almost like they're having different conversations. He says, a, a grain must fall into the ground and die before it can bear fruit. And then he goes on to say, those who love their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will, will find it or have it. And it, it's sort of like, well, okay, what does that have to do with Greeks wanting to talk to you? We just wanted permission. You know, I don't know. I mean, how's that conversation going? But let's go back to um, Jesus' encounter with other people like Samaritans and folks outside of his scope of who who's in and who's out. The Greeks would be that that group of, that's out 
considered on the outside of what um, Jesus in group would be. And so I think what what he might be saying, and I think the where this is related to these Greeks wanting to talk to Jesus right now, near his hour that is coming, you know, he is and the hour is upon him, and so it's you know, we gotta get ready for this. What I think it means is this whole idea of you lose your life, you'll find it. If you love your life, you'll lose it. And if you if you're if you were the grain of, of wheat, you must fall into the ground, you must die before you can bear good fruit. And what he's saying is we need to shuck off, you know, shed the layer that keeps us from experiencing the fullness of the kingdom, i.e. identity as I'm a Greek, you're a Jew, that's a Samaritan, you know, these categories. That is a, you know, it was a fundamental part of life, still is, incidentally. And what Jesus wants us to do is to shed those categories to, you know, you know, you're just shucking corn, you know, like when you shuck corn, you're shucking the category and you're getting down to the, the kernel, to the essence of who a person is, losing that part of your life, losing that external core, that external part that a grain has to lose in order to die in the ground and be germinate and then bear fruit. And so I think that's what that's meant by the Greeks have come to talk to you and Jesus responds, which seems so cryptic, but I think it relates because there, you know, Paul will say later, there is no Jew nor Greek. There's slave or slave or free, male or female. So these labels that we put on ourselves that we identify ourselves with, it's part of who we are, our life needs to get lost so that we might um, understand what's at the core of the self. And I think that's what Jesus' message is in the part where some Greeks, Greeks want to talk to him. And it's his hours upon him. So he is talking about uh, his troubled soul on the impending death and resurrection, uh, what what's going to happen to him. And again, the unbelief of the people. People don't believe in him. Um, and it's, but, but Jesus says, that's okay, because listen, this is what it says in the scripture. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they might not look with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. And so this is this is it's essential. So don't believe in me because guess what? You're going to rely on God and that will be the good the good part. And so he's just relating this back to um, the scripture from my, the prophet Isaiah. That's how it's referenced in John. And then um, I say, he says that he explains that, that he explains the prophet. He says Isaiah said this because he saw his glory and spoke about him. Nevertheless, many, even um, the authorities, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. They were scared for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. So this happens. And um, he's, got all these, he's got all these rivals and all these people coming after him. And the reason why he has all these people coming after him is because this strange thing happens. In John's Gospel only, we don't see this happen anywhere else. He cries out in his hours upon him. He cries out to God and God responds. So, and God says, um, I have glory. He just says, glorify your name. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. This is not Jesus speaking. This is a voice from heaven. And um, the crowd heard it. And some said it was thunder. And others argued that it was an angel. And Jesus said, this voice has come for your sake and not for mine. So meaning that, you know, this is so you will believe something, anything. Come on, people. Believe, believe, believe. Um, and he still can't get them to believe. And so uh, he says again, he likens himself to the light. I am the light. John starts out with this. In the very first chapter, and the light came into the world, and the darkness could not overcome it. And so he's, he's calling himself, same thing, calling himself the light again. Um, the light is with you a little while longer. Walk in the light while you have it. Walk in the light while you have it. And um, 
anybody believes in Jesus, believes in the one who sent him, and you're good. But he's having a tough time getting people to come along with him and what he's trying to do. Um, and he says everything that God has told him to say. So this, this crowd of people hear this voice. They say it's thunder. They say it's an angel speaking. And Jesus says, this is not for my benefit. It's for yours. You needed to hear this message. Walk in the light. And I hope today as you go about your day, brothers and sisters, you will be walking in the light. Amen.